everyone. Welcome to Global Express. So here we are, a day after Prime Minister Narendra Modi delivered his historic address on Capitol Hill uh, to the joint houses of Congress, preceded by the rock star reception he was given at the White House and the Mojo Jill bonding. They were holding hands. Uh, if there's one thing that is absolutely crystal clear, it is this. Despite all the so-called hesitations of history and the carping over India under Prime Minister Modi turning India into an illiberal democracy, Washington knows and understands that India is and will always be a democracy, what's and all, as they now freely admit that they are too. Which brings us to the big question, what does India get out of this partnership? Today on Global Express, we have Nurupama Rao, the highly respected diplomat who served as India's ambassador to Beijing and Washington. She will take us through the visit that the Prime Minister has already described as path-breaking. So, you know, the common catch catchphrases ambassador is, you know, are always used in these joint statements and media briefings, you know, rich in form, rich in substance. How would you look at it, ambassador? What are the pitfalls ahead? Could it run aground? It's taken 18 years to get to this pass. What do you see as happening going forward? Thank you, Nina. Well, you referred to the 18 years uh, that it had taken for us to get to this stage. And I, I'm glad you mentioned that point because this is a many storied relationship and the structure has been added on to over the years. And that is the first point that you have to keep in mind. Now, as far as uh, the official state visit of Prime Minister Modi, to Washington is concerned, the ongoing state visit. Obviously, uh, there's been a lot of pomp and circumstance surrounding the visit, but sifting through that, you have to really look at the brass tacks and the outcomes from the visit. Of course, it may be a little too early to pass judgment on those yeah. outcomes. And in fact, much of uh, what we see in terms of implementation will be played out in you know, months and years to come. So let's keep that in mind, separating all the hoopla that we see before us at the moment. I liked your reference to Mojo. That was brilliant. So uh, <laughs> It's from a headline. It's, <laughs> it's from a headline so, in the newspaper. So I I'd like, like to use the word consequential, which was something that I think President Biden used when he described the partnership. So it is a consequential partnership, a partnership that generates consequences. Meaning oh, that it's, to productive, yes. it's a productive partnership and um, it is a pillar partnership in the geopolitics of the world today, looking at the churn that surrounds us, looking at the Indo-Pacific, looking at the Indian Ocean situation, looking at the rise of China and keeping all that in mind, looking at what we as democracies, India and the United States, are aiming at as far as building this relationship is concerned. I think you have to keep that perspective in mind. And this is a partnership now, I noticed that uh, President Biden talked about a partnership grounded in democracy, in human yeah. rights, in freedom, in rule of law. And I think those phrases were repeated. They kept coming up. They were more no, but is that is that is that also uh... Uh, Nirupama, because they were these prods by all the columnists, you know, at both at home and the US, saying that, you know, in, uh, Washington is held back from a public dressing down, uh, you know, on the curbs on religious and media freedom. I mean, even Barack Obama, he said that there should be, should, he should be, uh, you know, this should be talked up. So Biden, I think, has done the uh, the delicate balancing act by saying that, you know, they were going to talk about it in private rather than make a big deal of it in public, uh, you know, it was a smart move, I think. Uh, you know, I mean, after all, he did call Xi Jinping a dictator just a day after, you know, Anthony Blinken's visit uh, to Beijing. So walk softly, but no stick. Tread softly, but carry a big stick, as Teddy Roosevelt yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, but I noticed that in his remarks at the press conference, the joint press conference, while they answered questions on human rights and uh, religious freedom, I noticed that uh, Mr. Biden mentioned challenges 
faced by both countries. And I think he mm. put it very diplomatically, very elliptically, when he talked about the challenges to human rights, democratic values, press freedom, he mentioned press freedom, yes. religious freedom, tolerance and diversity. So it's sort of embedded, those words are embedded in this joint statement, which really is all sweetness and light otherwise, you know, in terms of uh, all that the two governments are going to do. And more importantly, I think looking beyond uh, these issues of dem democratic values, if you look at the, the actual meat and potatoes in the statement, it's uh, essentially the critical and emerging technology cooperation, mm. which will yes. form the pillar of the partnership. And I think that is where the action is going to be not only on defense and security, which of course, you know, the, the GEF 414 jet engines uh, production uh, within India, sharing transfer of technology with India, which is which is huge implications. It means generation of jet fighters produced for our Air Force, our fighting arm, will have American jet engines, which is which is a which is a great milestone, I think. And we'll have to see how it plays out in terms of how um, you know, the HAL will be prepared for this, how uh, the US Congress will clear uh, all, that, all the uh, formalities associated That's with right. when it comes to transfer of technology. So in a sense, um, the devil is always in the detail, but I think we have mm. to take strength from the fact that these outcomes, which really point to critical technology cooperation between India and the United States, both two democracies, against you know what has happened vis-a-vis -vis US and China. When you look at the CHIPS Act, when you look at what is happening, when Jake Sullivan talks of a small yard with a high fence, it's yes. essential. I think India is being admitted into that small yard. And I think we have yeah. to take, as I said, that is a that is a very positive development. So do you believe, I mean, you've served in China, you you know, you know it inside out. Uh, do you feel that uh, Xi Jinping has blundered, uh, you know, with this wolf warrior diplomacy and, you know, this whole business of, uh, you know, beefing up and, and making a, you know, a mess in Ladakh and Galwan? Do you think he's gone too far uh, in pushing it? Because China was uh, uh, and is uh, to a great extent, even today, uh, the beneficiary of, uh, you know, U.S., uh, and tell, um, you know, all of this uh, tech, 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 technology and so on and so forth. So have, have, do you think he's blundered? In, and I mean, in fact, India is now being pushed literally into the U.S.'s arms. Hmm. Well, I don't know if uh, India would, you know, uh, be pushed. I mean, India is not a country that really can be pushed into anybody's arms. Nudged. Nudged um, then. <laughs> maybe, maybe it is sidestepping a little, maybe going a little closer to the US. Uh, that may be the case. And uh, yes, when it comes to um, what uh, China under Xi Jinping, I remember a few weeks ago, I think the editor of The Economist, who just returned from China, called it a one man state. You know, oh. we call, we used to, we, generally refer to China as a one-party state because it's ruled mm. by the Communist Party. But she said it's very much a one-man state. And I think that is a statement I'm ready to accept in terms of how you see the mark, the imprint of, you know, it's like Xi Jinping was here on everything that, that the Chinese do say geopolitically uh, in terms of their foreign policy, in terms of what they proclaim to the world, in terms of the control on uh, the population within China. You saw that during the COVID. In fact, in fact that's exactly what I was Demi going to get to. There's also this, this uh, uh, going around, another story I read, which said that the young people are refusing to cooperate. They're sort of lying low. You know, mm -hmm. and they're not participating in the, you know, the, in the whole workforce and the willingness that was there in the generation that preceded them. And that, that is actually also a very dangerous trend. And China's economic growth is slowing down. And one does hear reports of uh, joblessness, especially among the trained uh, population, students and graduates mm -hmm. who come out of universities. Uh, jobs are not that easily available. So, of course, one doesn't get to see and hear 
Much of what is happening in China, there's a great deal of control on the dissemination of news, as you know, and the internet is, is you know, there is a, there are internet nannies all around in China. So, you know, you're not able to really get, get the word of how that, but I'm sure within the, um, the Chinese youth, particularly, and those, you know, who are connected uh, via, you know, modern telecommunications to each other. I'm sure there are many code words to describe and explain uh, what they feel. It's quite, quite interesting. That is a subject, can be the subject of another discussion. But yes, Xi Jinping, I think, has, in a way, uh, you know, uh, devoided China of its friends, really. And uh, all across the world, it, China is viewed so differently from what it was 10 years ago, a decade ago. And this has to do, you have to attribute it to the policies of the leadership and, uh, and, the, and the impact and effect of China's policies in our region when it comes to maritime disputes, when it comes to the dispute over the border with India, when it comes to wolf warrior diplomacy and, and the way the Chinese have operated in our neighborhood, you've seen, you know, with the Belt and Road and, and you know, the very, um, uh, I, would, I would call it in, in many ways, a diplomacy or foreign policy based on naked self-interest and devoid of any values. Although boilerplate statements out of Beijing will always talk in a holier than thou way about how you know, China is, is you know, blemishless and uh, China is doing good for the rest of the world. You know, they talk- No, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, when he, when he gave this speech at the Congress, uh, you know, he made uh, a side swipe at Pakistan because saying home of terror. And uh, he also took a side swipe at uh, China, but he, there was not even a word against Russia. You know, so, I mean, I understand perfectly about India's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan and, and China. Where do we actually stand on Russia? You've written a brilliant piece in Foreign Affairs also on the subject. It's, it's, it's quite interesting to see this not unraveling, but sort of this, the, the idea that we could actually divest ourselves of our Russian links in the years to come, if not right away, because of their... Uh, you know, what their invasion of Ukraine. Where do we go with that? You know, even as we talk about a trusted partnership with the United States, which of course is a statement of fact, uh, there is also this partnership with Russia, you know, which dates back to the Soviet times, and which is one of the pillars of our foreign policy. The foreign minister, Dr. Jayashankar, referred to the relationship with Russia a few days or weeks ago as a cardinal principle of our foreign mm. policy. So, mm. you know, Russia is not, not the past as far as we are concerned. Russia is very much the present and could be part of our future too, because, you know, Russia and India, this is a legacy relationship, but it's a legacy relationship that is still, you know, yielding, uh, is productive for us because we have our defense linkages with Russia and post uh, the Ukraine crisis, you know, with the energy uh, security questions that have been the fallout of the Ukraine crisis, this has resulted in India importing so much more uh, crude Oil. from Russia, as you know, and we refine it and we sell it also, some of it to European nations. But we've kept below the price cap. It's not that we violated sanctions. There are no sanctions. One must recall, contrary to popular belief, you know, there are no sanctions against buying Russian crude. It's it's just that we have to keep to that price cap because, you know, but there uh, was a threat. The of West Katsa. doesn't want doesn't want Russian crude to be sold at at, at a high price, but it high wants price. Russian crude to be because it doesn't want to help Putin. It wants to reduce its revenues, but it it wants Russian crude to be sold because if it's if we completely cut off supplies of Russian oil. Can you imagine the price of oil worldwide would go up to $200 a barrel? Maybe, you know, it, it would be hugely uh, negative in terms of its impact for all of us, regardless of whether we're East or West, North or South. 
And we in the global south, I think, are particularly concerned about these things. And India has led the way, which I had referred to in my article in Foreign Affairs. Also, India sees itself as the heartland of the global south. So India also wants to be, uh, I, I mean, I've always wondered, I mean, I, I see America, uh, you know, positioning India as a sort of bulwark against China, uh, both in the Indian Ocean uh, and, uh, you know, in, in the uh, Malacca Straits and, and on our territorial border. But are we also positioned, grow, uh, do, what, what do we get out of this relationship? I mean, is it, is it be becoming the defense manufacturer or the tech power? What, what are we aiming at? What do we get out of being, you know, uh, taking on this role as, uh, as a policeman, so to speak, of the Indian Ocean? No, I don't, I don't really think that is the aim when we talk of trusted partnerships with the United States. And uh, the fact that uh, both our countries are creating what Condoleezza Rice said more than two decades ago, a balance of freedom in the Indo-Pacific. Given the rise of China and the tensions that have been generated as a result of that rise and China's you know, actions, not only in our neighborhood, but across the region. So the, the strong strategic partnership, as it's called, between India and the United States helps us. It helps our defense and security. Take intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, ISR, you know, we are hoping to purchase those 30 MQ-9B Predator Zone Predator. from General Atomics from, uh, you know, the U.S. And that is really going to be, uh, will help on our land borders. It will help as far as our maritime security is concerned. I think it augments our capability to defend ourselves. And when we talk of a defense industrial partnership with the U.S., and we are talking of Make in India and trying to build our own Atmanirbhar as far as defense production is concerned. The transfer of technology that we hope will be flowing as a result of this partnership in critical and emerging technologies between our two governments, between the private sectors, and with academic establishments also contributing to research and development. I think this is a whole new chapter in the relationship. That's right. Even that investment, the investment yeah, by, uh, by Micron too. Technology, Absolutely. Uh, you know, 825 million by a US chip maker, that, that, that's remarkable. That yes, then sets up that semiconductor. Think, absolutely. And something that seems to have missed, uh, I think, the headlines is this, uh, you know, India being invited to become the newest member of the Mineral Security Partnership. And this is partnership. What is that? Yes, that is partnership on critical minerals that go into the semiconductor industry. Like, like lithium. lithium. Like cobalt, like graphite. Now, this mineral security partnership had been established, I think, a year or so ago by the United States and its close allies and friends. And India had been excluded from that. And I'm, you know, it is, I think, a positive development to see India included in that, because that will also help develop sustainable critical energy minerals and the supply chains associated with that, with India also being a part of it. In fact, Ambassador, that's a very interesting uh, point because I remember when I was talking to people in Afghanistan straight after the uh, Americans withdrew, one of the things that they brought up again and again is that the lithium mines in, uh, you know, in uh, Afghanistan were being tapped by the Chinese through the Taliban. And that this this whole the 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 pathway out was to take it from Afghanistan uh, through Pakistan and uh, and and then to uh, China. So China is the biggest beneficiary actually of the uh, you know the evacuation of America from uh, you know from Afghanistan. Talking uh, of China becoming the biggest beneficiary, you talked about Russia and India. Now you know the West perhaps doesn't look at it this way. But with the crisis in Ukraine and the West's complete preoccupation with that crisis and Russia being relatively boxed in as a result, China is a totally free hand as far as Eurasia is concerned, as far as our region is concerned. Not many people focus on that, which is exactly why India has to keep its connections open with Russia. You That's very interesting. You cannot want to leave Russia in the lurch. I mean, Russia is, can be accused 
and uh, you know regarded guilty for all the transgressions of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, human rights violations, and all the you know the destruction that that has emanated as a, that has been the result of this war. But keep in mind that Russia is a pole as far as our multipolar world situation is concerned. And you, you just can't afford it to let, uh, go down like that because the Chinese are going to be the biggest beneficiaries of that kind of outcome. And there's also this people to people connect. I mean, the Indian diaspora, I mean, the major drivers of this relationship are of the Indian origin, uh, you know, uh, politicians and people, members of the Senate and the Congress who've pushed it. And two of them very... running for president, in fact. Yes, but Nikki Haley has has actually trashed the trashed Modi. She's made some very impolitic remarks on Modi. I haven't actually read it. I just saw a, a, a tweet uh, on it. But I, I I think there is also a pushback from some of the uh, Indian origin people. But I mean, there's education, there's visas, there are new consulates, and then of course you have uh, the the uh, all these. Uh, people who head the IT companies and all of that. But did, was it was it like that when you when you served in Washington? I mean, was there the same kind of push and same kind of excitement that the, that that existed at that point, or is this a new well, is this a new thing? Well, I think you could you could certainly see uh, you know the signs of things to come, and you already had uh, Indian American members of Congress at that time. And, uh, and, and you had, uh, you know, for instance, Sri Srinivasan, who was, who was uh, you know, uh, then considered likely to even become a Supreme Court judge, because he didn't ultimately do that, but a very brilliant young lawyer. And so, uh, and then there was Satya Nadella, when I was ambassador, he was already, he'd just become head of Microsoft, you had Indra Nui heading PepsiCo. Mm. So you, you did have uh, prominent Indian Americans. So this was already a factor in the relationship. The role of the Indian American diaspora has been hugely important for the growth of this relationship. And you know they are in the American mainstream. When you have uh, members of Congress, members of the House, and the, you know, hopefully soon members of the Senate, and then you have Nikki Haley, people like Nikki Haley running for President of the United States. It's a whole new dimension that the diaspora gets to occupy as a result, and it's a and it's a very prosperous diaspora. It's very well qualified, and there's a very very positive impression and image that they enjoy in among the American public, and that generates obviously uh, you know assets as far as india is concerned they're a huge asset to this relationship so final word if you can just tell us what your biggest takeaway is from this visit what is it that makes us a stronger better nation being a part of this uh, you know not alliance but you know grouping well, I think the strategic, the comprehensive global strategic partnership, as it's called, between India and the United States, generates a lot of benefit for India's growth and development. It is important for our partnership with the United States, with India being an equal contributor. You know, there, there, there are no junior partners in this setup. We are equal partners with the United States and we together can contribute a great deal to peace and security in the Indo-Pacific. And the fact that we're democratic countries, I think sends out a very strong message, open, accessible, transparent, for all our flaws and shortcomings, every democracy has that. But ultimately it's that critical mass that we bring to bear on the, uh, on, on the world you know, when Mr. Modi talks of world as, as one family, I think it, the, this kind of a relationship, a bilateral relationship between two of the world's largest democracies can really make a difference. And then ultimately I'd say that it's the people to people ties that bind our two countries. People at the, are at the heart of this endeavor and almost every field of human endeavor is now being covered by this relationship. And there are solid, uh, as I said, consequences that emanate from that, whether it's in education, whether it's in health, whether it's in critical emerging technologies, 
and defense and security and of course uh, clean energy and and uh, yes. uh, you know policies you know in order to uh, reach net zero in order to promote decarbonization in order to reduce methane emissions all the work that we are doing together with and also within the international solar alliance which the united states has also joined so these are all you know pillars of this relationship so it's not just as i said not the pomp and show just of, a, of an official state visit uh, that of course really adds color and to uh, add lot of spectacle to this, but at the heart, at the core, look at the core of this relationship and look at the benefits that come to both our countries from what yeah. we do. In fact, I love the way that Modi toasted uh, Jill Biden for taking care of his uh, meals, you know, at the uh, dinner, which was, which yes. was very, which was very heartfelt. Uh, you know, so I think the bond between uh, the Bidens and Modi is also a, quite a surprise. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it, it really is an eye opener on how these kind of synergies are the ones that actually take relationships forward, you know, Absolutely. But, uh, Absolutely. thank you. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate thank you coming on the show. And I hope we can do this again, Sean, as soon as thank we you. can. Thank All you. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks. Bye.